We good now? All right. Are you telling me the truth? <laughs> I'm just going to keep talking. I bring you uh, greetings within the Parkside framework. Uh, if you're new to Parkside and all that's taking place, you'll know we sort of have the mothership uh, in Bainbridge, uh, which has been there for quite a long time. And then from that, we've continued over the last seven or eight years to ask for God to give us greater favor within the greater Cleveland area in terms of gospel opportunity through local churches. And so about seven years ago, uh, we established Parkside Church Green, which is down near the Akron Canton area, which is about 100 years from here to get there uh, when you're up here. Then uh, you guys are three and a half years old, I think. You may not know that, but you are. Uh, Parkside Church, Lake County. And then, uh, as Scott said, God willing, this fall, we hope to launch Parkside Church Westside. Uh, we're actually uh, planning to be in Lakewood, but since you already had the naming rights for Parkside Lake anything here, we had to go with something more general and bland, Parkside Westside. But uh, that's at least where we find ourselves. So uh, we continue to meet with a core group of people on Sunday evenings a couple times a month in Lakewood, and uh, we're encouraged by uh, anyone showing up, uh, at least th that's, that's me being really honest. And then, uh, but beyond that, it's just actually a consistent group of people that are coming, so uh, we're thankful for that, and uh, we're hoping September-ish to, uh, to get going on the other side of town. So friendship on that realm, and then friendship also, uh, just personally with the guys who are part of your pastoral team, I was just, as I was sitting here, I was thinking about the fact that uh, within the past 10 days, I was at a birthday party for both of them. One turned 25, the other turned 40. I'll let you sort out those categories, but... <laughs> The one who turned 25 was particularly thrilled because he could now drive the church van because he was allowed to under the insurance policy realm. So <laughs> the small celebrations in life. But uh, these guys are both my friends, and uh, I've actually known both of them for about the same amount of time, the better part of a decade, and just glad for our gospel partnership together. So let me say a word of prayer. And then uh, we'll continue on this morning. Father, we thank you that even as we've just remarked about just the tiny little things that we see here in the greater Cleveland area of local churches being established and your people gathering together in order that we might reach a group of people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ, we thank you that the things that we see are just a sliver of all that's taking place around the world, that at this very moment, undoubtedly so, there are others who bow the, their heads in a, in a service of worship others who are in the early part of their days preparing and asking for your favor and those who will come behind us. And so it's amazing to us to think about how worldwide and expansive your involvement is in the lives of people. And we find ourselves just so humbled to be a part of it. And we pray now, Father, that you would actually draw near to us. We very much want to draw near to you. And we pray that you give us hearts to listen this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, and then also if you want to just stick your finger in Matthew chapter 18, I'm going to read two passages for us this morning, but we'll at least start with Ephesians chapter 4, and it's just one short verse which I'll read for us. It'll be familiar to you perhaps, Ephesians 4 verse 32. I think also in your, uh, in your bulletin this morning, there's an outline if you care to follow along in it that way too. And if you don't have a Bible there, the verses are printed for you there too. Ephesians 4, 32, we read as following. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Well, we come this morning to a study in the, in the one another's that we have in the Bible. It's right here in Ephesians 4, 32. This, two, this little two-word phrase, one another, is just sprinkled all over the New Testament. And it's done so as a way for Christians to understand how relationships are to work. So if you were to thumb through the New Testament, you'd find things like love one another, serve one another, show hospitality to one another, or the one that every 14-year-old finds really, really intriguing, greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> it's just the way that you affectionately said hello to someone in the ancient world. So why don't you just lean over to the person next to you there. You know, the surest way to never get invited back again. No, 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 it's... It was affectionate. Greet one another with a holy kiss. It was, it was more than the courteous handshake. It was kind of like the fist bump or the man hug. It's a sense of saying, you mean much to me because of who you are in Jesus Christ. One another. And this morning we come to probably one of the, if you like, the weightier one another's that we have in the Bible. And that is that we are to forgive one another. 
think it's fair to say that we all struggle with forgiving others and our need also to be forgiven. There's much written about what it means to forgive. Sort of the conventional wisdom of our day and age today says, well, you just need to forgive and forget, even you know it. Or you just need to move on and bury the incident. But the wisdom of God helps us to understand that forgiveness is actually far more costly and complicated than just that notion. And the Bible actually gives us hope that even in the darkest of circumstances, that forgiveness is possible. Because one of the bright truths that runs through the Bible is that God himself is a forgiving God. And that those who will receive the forgiveness that he offers us through his son will actually be transformed by the experience of divine forgiveness and actually begin to display his forgiving ways toward other people. And the change that will happen inside of your life is powerful. You, all, you could almost say that it's otherworldly what God will do in you because it will change the way you move toward those who wound or wrong you. It's powerful. As another pastor put it, forgiveness for the Christian means that not all relationships will be blown up. Not all relationships will be blown up. Now, an exhaustive study of, of this topic, forgiveness, is really beyond the scope of our time together this morning. And so I have intentionally left some things unaddressed. I'm sure there are unintended oversights on my part too, but I'm actually completely okay with that because the great benefit will be in the follow-up one-to-one conversations in which we have with each other. It'll be both necessary and helpful. But so it is that at least for our time together today, as we think about forgiveness, it's just going to come under two main ideas. First of all, understanding forgiveness. Secondly, experiencing forgiveness. Understanding, experiencing And our verse from Ephesians 4.32, it really just gives us the main thought. If you go, well, what's the whole deal this morning? It's just this in a few words. As Christians, we are to be kind-heartedly forgiving one another. Be kind-heartedly forgiving one another. Now, I mentioned Matthew 18 to keep your finger in there because there's a story that Jesus told. It's recorded us for us in Matthew's gospel in chapter 18 that I like to read for us because I think it just wonderfully illustrates many of the dynamics of forgiveness. So if you flip over there with me, and I'll just say that we won't turn to other passages beyond this one, but this is a good one for us to plant down into. Matthew chapter 18, and I'll read uh, through the end of the chapter for us. We read as following. Then Peter came up and said to him, Jesus that is, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Amen. Well, you probably have a header in your Bible that precedes verse 21 that says this, the parable of the unforgiving or unmerciful servant. And that immediately helps us to get our bearings as as readers or as, as listeners. Because parables as they are utilized in the Bible are just short stories that are easy enough for everybody to understand, but they always contain a punchy little surprise to them to help the listener grasp how life works in relationship to God and his ways, which are often so different from our ways. And so no surprise, Jesus being the master teacher often used parables to make the murky more clear 
In this instance, helping us understand what forgiveness means and necessitates. And you'll notice in verse 21 that an earnest question on the subject of forgiveness comes from Peter, one of his closest followers. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And before Jesus even has an opportunity to respond, Peter offers up an answer to his own question as many as seven times. You see, to, within Judaism, to forgive someone three times was generally to be considered that you've got a forgiving heart within you. So when Peter offers up the number seven, he thinks he's being quite generous, and he is. Well, if the question was earnest, then the answer was completely unexpected. Because Jesus' response of not just forgiving seven times, but 77 was truly shocking, meaning this, that those who, are, who will follow after him are to forgive without keeping tally. I sort of picture Peter staring back with a surprised look on his face, his mouth ever so slightly open. So Jesus says, Peter, let me tell you a story, a story that might help you understand why this type of radical accounting about forgiveness is necessary. It's a story about a king and a servant who owed a great debt to the king. And so we're thrust back some 2,000 years ago into a culture of kings and servants but remember, this is an earthly story with a heavenly lesson. So we need to pay attention who the characters are. You can't draw strong conclusions about everything, but some things are intended to be obvious. And so it is here that in many ways, the king in this story represents God, the maker of all things and all people. He's powerful. He owns everything. And the first servant that's described can really be associated with any one of us. But this fellow has a grave problem. He owes a massive debt to his master. You see it there, verse 24. He owes some 10,000 talents. A talent just being the currency of their day. It's like our dollar bills. And some scholars, you know, they get out their slide rules and do the math and work the functions. And they go, oh, it was millions or billions. Whatever it was, it was absolutely overwhelming what he owed. I found myself thinking about the type of money required to pay back this type of debt as one of those metallic briefcases. You know, the, you know what I'm talking about? You see in the movies, you... you Get the combination locking. You slide it open, you open it up, you hear to turn it around. Inside are just stacks and stacks, finely stacked $100 bills. But not just one metallic case to pay back this debt. Many, many cases are needed. And the point for us isn't to get distracted going, oh, what a poor steward that guy is. How could he ever amass that type of debt? No, that's not the point. Remember, the point is this. It's a story with a purpose. We should actually share in the anguish of the first servant. He owes a debt that he can never, ever pay back. Have you ever owed a debt? Well, here he finds himself. And so the king determines that the servant and his family will be sold in order that payment might be made. That sort of rings strangely in our ears, but not to Peter's ears. Being sold like this was certainly not a pleasant experience, but it was it's common practice in the ancient world as a punishment for those whose debts couldn't be repaid. And before the servant is ushered away, he pleads the only case that he can. No excuses, no blame shifting. Falls to his knees and asks for more time to pay back the debt, which is just completely preposterous. Even if you take the potential of a lifetime of earning power and employment, he could never even begin to scratch the surface. And so the king... He takes in the emotional scene before him, and he does what only he has the power to do. Verse 27, moved out of compassion or pity for the servant. The master of the servant released him <clears throat> and forgave him the debt. Now that, in and of itself, would make for a truly remarkable story with a lesson, but there's actually more yet to come. Here comes the punchy surprise. Because the first servant leaves the presence of the king and he runs into another servant who owed him a debt. It wasn't a large debt, but certainly not inconsequential. So maybe just a few thousand dollars. So if the first guy needs a few shiny briefcases full of $100 bills stacked inside, then I, I just think like the second guy, he probably just needed a leather wallet with a few Benjamins tucked inside and then his, his payment could be made. It isn't much. And naturally, of course, we would expect the first fella to show a measure of the compassion and pity that he had just received. But instead, he seizes, he chokes, he bellows into the ear of the other man, pay what you owe. 
Did you see how carefully the details are that are described here? What what does the other servant do? He falls to his knees, pleading for patience and time to pay back the debt. It's nearly identical phraseology from the conversation between the king and the first servant. And then two outrageous words describe what happened next. Verse 30, he refused having the second servant put into prison. Well, news travels fast among the kingdom, even without texting and Twitter. Because word gets back to the king about the deplorable actions of the first servant. The man is ushered back into the presence of the king. He's no longer now identified as the first servant. He's glossed with the title, you wicked servant. And the now outraged king reminds the wicked servant of the compassion that he had been shown. And then he asks the rhetorical question. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And before there is time for a response... He's ushered out and taken off into the jail cell. And then Jesus steps out of storytelling mode for just a second. And he connects the dots for Peter to make sure that he's got it. Remember, it's a lesson about what the kingdom of heaven is like, how things work in relationship to God and his ways. And so Jesus says to Peter, verse 35, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Here's the punchy surprise. How absurd for one forgiven so much to refuse to forgive so little. It means this, friends, that if you and I have experienced God's forgiveness in our lives, we will in turn be compelled, be compelled to be people who forgive. So if that's the case, Let's make three observations from this story that will help us in understanding forgiveness. In understanding forgiveness. First of all, we notice this. We see here that that forgiveness is a decision to mercifully cancel a debt. It's a decision to mercifully cancel a debt. It's exactly what happens in the parable. The king makes the debt of the servant go away by absorbing the cost of it into himself. He looks at the Excel sheet, which documents the deep debt of the servant, and, and he tears it up, or he, or he pushes delete on Google Drive. He makes it go away, never to return. And then, and only then, is the record made right. Why? Because someone always pays a debt in order for there to be forgiveness. Somebody always pays a debt. Now think about the last time that someone wounded or wronged you. What happened to you inside? The same thing that happened to me inside. This strong notion builds up within you, wanting to make the other person pay for what they've done. So maybe you, you burst out at them, you lashed out at them, letting them know of your anger and your hurt. Or maybe you're the more quiet sulker type, and you just put emotional distance between the, bit, the two of you, just bitterly hoping that they get their comeuppance, that something bad happens to them. And you're making them pay with your actions, or so it seems like it at least. And you think that it will settle the debt, But it doesn't, does it? Because when you refuse to forgive, your anger exhausts you and your heart just grows terribly, terribly bitter. That's why the notion of our cultural perspective on forgiveness doesn't work. You can't just forget about it. You just can't bury the incident and move on. A debt must be paid in order for restoration to begin. We see also that in the parable that forgiveness, it's, It's totally undeserved. The king's compelled to respond out of compassion and pity toward the servant, but certainly not in response to what the servant had done or had to offer. And forgiveness isn't something that is earned or deserved. If you've earned it, you're just getting what you deserve, and that's not forgiveness, that's that's justice. Forgiveness, as Julia Marsden defines it, says this. Forgiveness looks sin in the face, calls it sin, but then says, it's over between the two of us. It's done. It's over. That's giving forgiveness, not looking for justice. Which then means this, that forgiveness is actually limitless. If someone doesn't deserve it, then you can never reach a point where you say, well, that's too much now. She doesn't deserve to be forgiven anymore. If she deserved to be forgiven, it wouldn't be forgiveness. But let me give just a word of brief biblical balance here. This 
this doesn't mean there are to be no consequences for the other person's actions. In some instances, they may face the full force of our legal system. This doesn't mean that you must treat an offender exactly as if the offense had never taken place between the two of you. This is about what happens in your heart and your response toward the other individual. And amazingly so, in the mystery of God's purposes, when you cancel the debt between the two of you, you actually begin to be freed. Which is our first point, that for, that, and understanding forgiveness, that it's a decision to mercifully cancel a debt. Secondly, we see this. Forgiveness is an event and a process. It's an event and a process. I think this is what Jesus was getting at when he answered Peter's question. You don't just forgive someone once, three times, or seven times. It's more like 77 times because the point isn't to keep track, but never to give up forgiving. So there's something instantaneous that happens between two people when the debt is canceled. It's gone, never to return. The, the event in itself, of itself is complete. But sometimes when when the debt owed has emotional or has relational ties to it, even though we forgive, we still find ourselves tethered to the hurt. I wonder if you've ever experienced this before. I have a friend of mine who's a missionary in, in a country outside of the U.S., and one night there were some men who were, who were unhappy with this man and the work he was doing for Jesus. They were antagonistic toward the gospel. So in response to that, they broke into this man's house, and, and they just beat him severely. Understandably so, he's, he's physically wounded, he's just emotionally harmed. And within a short time of that incident, this missionary was talking to, to one of my friends. And so my friend asked him, he said, brother, how, how are you doing? And the missionary said, amazingly so. He said, you know, I've been able to forgive these fellows and, and I'm moving on. I wasn't in the conversation my friend was telling about it, so I would guess, knowing these two men in the way that I do, they probably just paused right there and thanked God that they could even say and experience such a thing. But then my friend, he tenderly but directly said this to the missionary. He said, brother, the truth of the matter is that you've just begun the process of forgiving. And it wasn't long before his wise words proved to be exactly spot on. Because the injustice of that night and the beating undeserved kept coming back into the man's heart. And so what did he have to do? keep going back and reminding himself that he had already forgiven and praying for grace to continue to do so. And what was true for him has to be similarly true for you and for me. Because you set out to forgive someone and suddenly you're drawn back into the hurt of the incident all over again. Maybe it's now uh, the calendar date one year later or there's a passing scent in the air and suddenly you're snapped back into that situation all over again. And your anger, your resentment, your self-pity, it just works up within you. And our experience affirms what the Bible teaches that forgiveness isn't usually instantaneous, at least in the way it feels. And then emotionally speaking, speaking it's often granted before it's felt, which is why it's so important to understand that it's both event and a process. It's settled between the two of us. I just have to keep reminding myself that it's settled between the two of us. And our third point on understanding forgiveness, it's just this. Not forgiving has eternal implications not forgiving as eternal implications. Look at the closing words from Jesus in the parable. Verse 34 and 35, he tells the story and then he sums it all up in this way. And in anger, his master delivered him, the wicked servant to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. In other words, there is a frightful fate for those who refuse to forgive, which is what the wicked servant discovered. If you and I aren't being transformed into forgiving people, it actually reveals the startling reality of our similarities to the first servant. Julia Marsden put it like this. She said, forgiving people is not an optional extra in the Christian life. It's like a litmus test of being a Christian. It's not what we do to earn God's forgiveness, but forgiving those who wrong us is a sign of the genuineness of our new life in Christ. Friends, the parable is actually told for Peter's listeners, for you and for me to grasp actually how great is the debt that we owe to God himself. The debt owed by the first servant represents how much we've sinned against God. 
the countless times that we've rebelled against him and it cost us, the occasions that we've stolen glory from him. Look what I've done when he's the one who's the giver of the gift to make it possible, not to mention the very soul debt that we are born into. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking through the claims of Christianity, then this will be one of the big ones for you to process because you find yourself thinking, well, these are strange things for you to say. I don't owe a debt to God. In fact, I'm probably the type of person that God would be pleased with because I'm a lot better than most of the other bad people that I see. And that may be true, sort of. Because just because you don't realize something to be true doesn't mean that it isn't true. A short while ago, I was at one of my son's soccer practice, and the coach was having them do these little dribbling drills. So all the little guys are lined up on one side of the field, and he would say things like, if you're wearing green socks, go. And everybody with some sort of green on their socks would dribble the ball down, sort of loosely kick the ball down the field to the other end. And then he would say something to go back the other way. So he's doing a few of these drills, and at one point, he says, if your family has a minivan, go. And I'm totally amused because 90% of the little guy, do, 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 you know, down the field, one of those young family stage of life things. So I'm watching them do it, and then I realize that my son is in the 10% of the guys who didn't go. Me knowing full well that our seven-passenger minivan sits out in the parking lot. <laughs> so I have this total parenting moment of conflict in my conscience. I go, I have no idea what to do right now. So I just sort of stared there, and I took it in, and then... I heard my son lean over to the other little guy and says, oh, our van isn't mini, it's just regular size. <laughs> <laughs> just because you don't realize something to be true doesn't mean that it isn't true. Whether we know it or not, whether we are willing to admit it or not, each of us, the Bible tells us, is actually indebted to God because of our sins. You may feel the weight of your mortgage, the, the panic over the monthly charges of your credit card statement, but all of that is chump change in comparison to the debt of our sins. And one of the devilish consequences of sin is that it actually blinds us from what is true about life and about ourselves. But some of you know this so much because you're here and you're burdened by a great debt and it's crushing you. How do I know that? Because you have such a hard time forgiving people. You're so easily wounded by any sort of comment that comes your way, and you're terribly, terribly unsettled all the time. So what do you do? Well, you think back to where we started. Ephesians 4, 32. It tells us what to do, but then beautifully so, it tells us how and why we can do it. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Experiencing forgiveness begins this way. The first step that you take toward experiencing forgiveness begins when you see that you owe a debt that you cannot pay, but that Jesus Christ has dealt with it on your behalf. That's how you began experiencing forgiveness, a day of salvation for you. And then if you're a Christian, this is actually what you keep doing to experience the wonders of forgiveness as the, real, as the beauty of this experience becomes increasingly real to you. And as that happens, you experience forgiveness. So you've got Jesus. He's telling this, this powerful story about canceling debts. But some of you are smart. You're paying attention. Well, you're all smart. I shouldn't say that. You, some of you are more keen to pay attention to the details than others. Because this parable, it actually raises a question for us within it that isn't answered. Because you find yourself saying, I mean, think about the guy who cancels the big debt. You go, well, where's the justice in that? Come on, let's be real here. Nobody just cancels a debt of a million or, or, or billions of dollars. Of dollars. You're the one who's been saying all along that you can't just forgive and forget and pretend that everything's fine. Where's, where's the justice? And the answer to that question is found in seeing this, that Jesus, the one who tells the powerful story about forgiveness in Matthew's gospel, is actually part of the greater story that's unfolding in Matthew's gospel. Because the events are moving forward to a scene where a man is crucified on a cross and the man who will hang on the cross is the one who tells the story. As, and so it is that in his death, Jesus, that justice is satisfied and forgiveness is made possible because the truth of the matter is God doesn't just forgive. When we rebel and sin against God, he doesn't ignore it 
or minimize it, but the good news of Christianity is that he also doesn't make us pay it because Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, think about the imagery, the treasure of heaven pays the debt for us. Those two words that he cries out from the cross, Father, forgive, are not meant for himself. They're meant for you. They're meant for me. Forgive them for their debt of sin, for their spiritual bankruptcy. Look upon them, Father, and see the riches of me. Jesus pays a debt and is spent so that we can be freed. Sin is, sin is not paid for by us, but it is paid for. And if you will trust in this thing, for yourself, then there's actually a, a beautiful transaction that takes place. That God the Father removes your sin from his sight, choosing to remember it no more, and instead his sight falls upon something else. Actually, it, it falls upon someone else. It falls upon his son, the one that who, though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich rich in your soul with forgiveness and grace, freed from your enslavement and debt. Will you believe these things today? Christian, if you have come to believe this, then keep believing these things today. This is where you and I must continue to, continue to look in order that we might truly live. And as we do so, God will begin to transform your life. Well, how do I know if he's transforming my life? Well, let me tell you what it'll look like. He'll grow a kind and tender heart within you that will be compelled to forgive others. It doesn't mean that your heart is impenetrable to the words and wounds of others, but rather this, that you now have some place to go with the hurt. You go to Jesus because he knows all about what it is to be wronged. You go to Jesus because one day he will make it all right, all Right, R-I-G-H-T. Listen to the words of Christina Hoover. She says this. Forgiveness means we leave the baggage of hurt with Jesus and walk away, knowing he will capably deal with the offender. Whether they ask for it or not, whether they acknowledge the hurt or not, whether they even know they hurt us or not, we leave it. We do so because we've been forgiven. We do it because if we hold on to it, then we have become the offenders in God's eyes, which is a frightful place to find ourselves. The Christian experience is so strange. It's not what you expect at all. Because you see, each time that the Christian is in conflict, and we are going to be in conflict with one another, and you sort of get interpersonally indebted to each other, well, that experience right there is one of the ways that God overrules all things evil for good because it's to be an opportunity, a reminder to the Christian of the debt that she once owed to God, but has been paid for by Jesus. And so as she chooses to forgive the other person, it actually helps her, it humbles her. And it's the means that God sets in place to grow and to shape her more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. So I close with this, two questions. No surprise here. Number one, who do you need to forgive? Or number two, who do you need to pursue and seek forgiveness from? So, is it your day to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me? Or is it your turn to begin the restoration process by saying, yes, I forgive you? You see, because to say either statement is an indication that God's transforming your life, that you've experienced that only Je you, can, you have experienced the forgiveness that Jesus alone can grant. And then you begin to realize, amazingly so, that Relationships for the Christian don't have to be blown up because they're never, ever beyond hope. Let's pray. Father, we stand amazed in the presence of, of Jesus, the Nazarene, the one who became flesh in order that we who are flesh and ruined and broken by sin might be forgiven and restored. And the promise that one day you will, you will put us back together, you will place us within a group of people, and you will take us to a place where everything that we've longed for in life will be realized. But for now, we live in, in a world that is that's cruel, it's broken, it's difficult, it's rebellious. And we pray, Father, that you would give us grace to forgive each other, 
especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, and to forgive those who are outside of your family, that we would be a reflection of the work that Jesus has done on our behalf, loved us undeservedly so, and made us his own. We pray for your help in these things. You, you know we need it, so we have no shame in coming and asking for your grace and help. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.